Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to the seventh season of Artivism, the power of art for social transformation. Art has, has massive power to move people to social change by using art as an innovative medium for awareness. Artists become advocates challenging the biggest issues of our time. Public art capitalizes on the power of socially aware work, reaching people in their everyday environments and confronting them with social injustice that is otherwise easily ignored. From sculptures addressing systemic racism to murals celebrating indigenous communities, public art is making a real world impact that deserves to be celebrated. Over the past three years, we've had the honor of celebrating over a hundred artivists from around the globe, including Adelphi students, faculty and staff, whose art, music, poetry, research, dance and advocacy has inspired us to do more. Student ambassadors from Adelphi and other institutions have been encouraged to participate in internships with artivists and their organizations and longstanding relationships have been forged. So what is the Artivism Initiative? Artivism, the power of art for social transformation was initiated in spring 2021 as a collaboration between Adelphi, Gottesman Library Teachers College, Columbia, and later the arts organization Sing for Hope. This interdisciplinary multi-institutional collaboration was initiated with a mission to engage people in changing society through the power of art. It builds upon the ideas of the book, Illuminations of Social Imagination, Learning from Maxine Green, co-edited by a Adelphi alum, Carolina Cambronero Varela, and faculty Dolopo Edinigi Neal and Courtney Lee Weda. Artivism, the Power of Art for Social Transformation, offers multimodal events where presenters share how art, research, community outreach, and other endeavors serve as a means to transform the social and status quo. Today, we are delighted to have as our student ambassador, Zoe Laidlow. Zoe is a high school sophomore studying film and creates multimedia art on her own time. Welcome, Zoe. Hi, my name is Zoe, and I am Danielle Sherry's um, niece, and I'm glad to be here to present her today. Danielle M. Sherry is a self-trained artist based in Brooklyn, New York. She is the founder of award-winning Home Decor Business Team for Original Art, which has been recognized in national magazine and newspaper publications, including the Yoga Journal, New York Amsterdam News, and the LA Subcommittee. Danielle creates functional abstract art for residential and commercial spaces and draws inspiration from the colorful flow of nature. She uses a fluid art technique as moving medi meditation practice to create abstract marble like designs on wooden and cer ceramic materials with acrylic paints and epoxy resin. Danielle is also a teaching artist partnering with community based organizations to facilitate classes for youth, adults, and senior citizens. Most recently, she has been collaborating with Think for Hope to design and paint pianos for senior citizens in New York. Additionally, Danielle has years of experience as a published children's artist, English as a second language teacher for adults, nonprofit manager of volunteer events, and community school director. She values community collaboration and using artistic expression as a way to heal and connect with others. Welcome, Danielle. Thank you for introducing me, Zoe. It means a lot to have you here, not only because you're my niece, but a fellow artist. Thank you to the entire Artivism team for inviting me to speak. It's an honor and privilege to be here as your keynote speaker. I wanna share a short memory about a day I spent with my niece, Zoe, at Governor's Island one summer. We took the ferry from downtown Manhattan over to the island to spend the day walking around, eating, ice cream before breakfast, exploring, taking photos, laying in hammocks, riding bikes, eating pizza, and following no one's rules but our own. We went where the wind blew us and we did what we felt like doing in the moment. We had fun. That experience was to teach a lesson of following the voice of our hearts and going with the flow. That day was dedicated to the art and privilege of being. I share that memory because it relates to my style as an artist, one who listens to that tiny voice inside that says, do what you feel. The joy and peace we desire lies within the matters of our heart. And that space can become confusing when comparing it to the world at large. There's power in finding the ability to quiet the noise 
by tapping into artistic expression to dig out the voice of our hearts. And the best part is being able to create an unapologetic mess while we dig. Artistic expression is our birthright, an opportunity to be as subjective as we desire. My art is abstract. It's the epitome of acknowledging no one's rules. I blend colors together based on my spirit, how I'm feeling at the moment. And over time, I've released more and more control over the paint. I started out by painting with a paintbrush on canvas, which lasted for about five years. After that, I transitioned into painting mostly with heavy body acrylic paint and a palette knife. And for the past four years, I have traded in my paintbrushes and palette knives for air. I now use soft acrylic paints and the air from my very own breath or a handheld hair dryer to paint. And it's such a free flowing experience. This form of painting has taught me the power of letting go and being flexible. This practice referred to as fluid art is a direct reflection of my lifestyle, one that embodies the element of water. And with water, the lessons of the energy is to flow, be, ride the wave, shift as necessary and seek clarity through every experience. What we do as artists, the things we create as artists are simply an extension of who we are spiritually. It's, tan it's a tangible, sometimes tangible expression of how we feel, which is one of the best things you can do for your heart. The world is an unpredictable place with many unsettling things happening all at the same time. The best thing we can do for the well-being of self is to find an artistic outlet that supports how we process energy and life experiences. There are times when I'm creating when I could feel the desire to reveal a new layer of my life, of life to my artwork, looking for it to evolve in some way. I began adding texture to satisfy the desire of touching the art and feeling something. The next level of evolution was creating art that could be of use. I desired giving more purpose to my art by making it not only decorative, but functional. And I began painting on coasters and serving trays, tables, and mirrors. This exploratory practice of creating art became my very own form of moving meditation. It brought me so much peace and I was especially grateful for it during a time when we were all experiencing a much quieter world. The pandemic, which shifted my practice of art into a world where a hobby would become a business. I am now approaching year three as founder and CEO of an award-winning home decor business, DMC Original Art. As I journeyed further into creating functional art, I became more and more interested in sharing my practice and skills with fellow humans of all ages, from elementary students to senior citizens. I have the great honor of partnering with organizations such as Sing for Hope, where we bring art programs to community centers working alongside seniors to design and paint pianos. These experiences are designed to unlock and amplify artistic interests. We all know art has the power to heal, but we never really understand the exact impact it will create until it's done. That's what makes our art essential, creating and sharing to inspire others in hopes that it will create a positive ripple effect. We are living in a world of so much noise and it has the ability to drown out the voice of our hearts. As an artivist, my mission is to lead by example, by sharing the power art has of quieting unnecessary noise of the world and amplifying the voice of our spirit. Art is a heart healer. Art is medicine. Art is accessible to us all because we are art. When in doubt, worry, fear, or any other intense emotion, turn to your art, lean on it, lean into it, dive in and make a mess. It must only make sense to you first. And even if it doesn't, at least you release the energy. With art, we become inspired. All forms of art have the ability to raise our awareness by piquing our interest. What type of art interests you the most? Explore it. Sing, paint, dance, design, cook, write, 
build, create. It's what we were designed to do in our very own special way, making our art as unique as we are. I didn't study painting in school, but I study nature, the way the golden sand meets the turquoise sea, the varied heights of green shaded trees, and the colors of a butterfly's wings painting the sky. And each colorful experience has inspired me to make a commitment to myself and maintain authenticity with my creations where everything I craft is one of a kind, just as it is in nature. The art we create has the ability to empower us and influence the way we show up in this world. Our art represents what we stand for. And oftentimes it speaks for us. I use art to speak to freedom. I use art to speak to peace. I use art to speak to well-being. I use art to speak to joy. I use art to speak to originality. I use art to speak to individuality. I use art to speak to fun. I use art to speak to the power of nature. I use art to speak to everything and sometimes nothing at all. I use art to express my deepest sentiments and my shallow curiosities. The one piece of advice I can give, if you take nothing away from the words I just shared, is to use your art to speak to what's important to you. Because sometimes that's the only way we will listen and the only way we can affect change. Use your art and transform the world. Thank you so much. And I would like to pass it all back to Zoe. Welcoming this week's presenter, Dr. George Omerini, is an assistant professor of professor of medicine at Yale School of Medicine, where he works as an internal and obesity medicine specialist. Dr. Moreno is originally from Mexico and was the first college graduate and doctor in his family. He graduated with a BA from Columbia College in 2006 and received his MD from the University of Rochester School of Medicine and Dentistry. In 2011. He completed his internal medicine residency at the Yale Primary Care Program in 2014. Initially, he worked in an internal medicine community practice in Connecticut and in 2018 returned to Yale as faculty in the Clinican Editor Track. He developed an interest for caring for patients with obesity and started a subspecialty obesity medicine clinic as part of his internal medicine practice. At Yale School of Medicine, Dr. Moreno has focused on developing obesity medicine curricula for medical students. Physician associate students and medical residents. Recently, Dr. Moreno was a featured obesity medicine expert in an Emmy winning special by Salomundo Yale Center for Clinical Investigation. The COVID 19 pandemic significantly influenced his clinical practice. He cares for patients with COVID-19 on the inpatient COVID unit and in the outpatient setting throughout the pandemic in Connecticut. He quickly recognized not only the lack of information in Spanish but co about COVID-19 and the vaccines available, but also the vaccine hesitancy that existed in the Hispanic community. His focus came to educating this community about COVID-19 in English and Spanish, Teaming with the Yale New Haven Health System. He participated in informational videos about the COVID-19 vaccine in Spanish. His outreach work with the Hispanic community led to collaborations with the Connecticut Department of Public Health and garnered media attention from local and national outlets. Recently, Dr. Moreno was selected as a 2023 National Hispanic Medical Association Leadership Fellow. Welcome, Dr. Moreno. Thank you so much, Zoe. I appreciate that introduction. Um, uh, thank you so much for having me uh, at this inaugural event. I'm very excited to speak to everyone today. Um, I'm gonna share some slides, but not, not to talk from the slides, but really to just use them as prompts. because I want the conversation to be informal. And if you have any questions as I, I go along, please interrupt me. Um, so let me try to go ahead and share my slides. Can everyone see that okay? 
Okay, great. Um, so as Zoe was saying, uh, my name is Dr. Jorge Moreno. I'm an assistant professor of medicine at Yale, and I'm also uh, an obesity medicine specialist. Um, so I'd like to begin today by uh, telling you a story. Um, I think uh, Carolina has heard this story before, but I think uh, it really kind of establishes where I'm coming from so that um, uh, you see uh, a little bit more of who I am. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and read this. So let me begin by telling you the story of a six-year-old boy who lived in a small rural town in a town of Michoacán, Mexico. One day, his parents told him, nos vamos para los Estados Unidos. We're going to the U.S. The boy did not know all the details of what this meant. Before he knew it, he was sitting in the front of an old four station wagon. in La Frontera at the U.S.-Mexico border. The brown station wagon had four people sitting on an extra long front seat, and the boy was sitting next to a driver, a stranger. His parents called him El Coyote, a smuggler. Next to this boy sat his three-year-old sister, and next to, his, um, next to his sister sat his mother, who was pregnant at the time. In the back sat his two older siblings. The boy's father had gone ahead and traveled before them and would meet them up later. It was a cold and crisp January night without a cloud in the sky. The moon shined brightly over this family and the boy could see several bright spotlights scanning the area right next to a long wire fence. El Coyote suddenly yelled out, agáchate, duck. For a moment, the spotlights moved away from that area. El Coyote yelled out, órale, vámonos, corran. The boy and his family ran towards the fence that had a small opening with jagged edges on the bottom. The boy ran, slid through the hole in the fence. Suddenly, his jean pocket got stuck on one of the jagged edges. The boy was stuck. His heart was racing. His palms were sweating. He could see his rapid breathing in the cold air. He just pushed on, ripping his jeans to be free. He made it. His entire family made it to the United States. The year was 1991, and that little boy was me. So my path to medicine was not always straightforward. It was very winding. Uh, many of you may know this image from Dr. Seuss, um, all the places you'll go. Um, and the reason why I bring this particular image up is because of the bumps along the road, right? And I think that Many people know that there's many bumps along the road. So since I was young, I knew I wanted to be a physician. I knew I wanted to work in primary care. And the reason why that was the case was my, um, my family, my mom, my dad, they didn't speak very much English. I didn't speak English at age six. And so I felt, um, I saw the struggles firsthand my parents had in the healthcare um, clinics and just trying to navigate the healthcare system. I really feel committed to really helping um, them out and really trying to see how I can help them and help others like them in the future. So I had no idea how to be a doctor. I learned as I was going on the way. So um, I worked hard. I, um, I was able to uh, learn English and graduate in the top 10% of my class and fortunate enough to go on to be uh, accepted to Columbia University. Um, at Columbia, I, as many first generation students know, there's a lot of struggles with any um, college experience, right? The rigors of the academics are much, uh, much harder. Um, the social environment is much different than what we're used to as first generation students. Navigating the system is very different. And so I really try to, uh, figure it out, and had some growing pains as I transitioned there. But I, I will always remember a conversation I had um, uh, in after Biology 101. Um, so in Biology 101, I did not do as I expected. I received a C uh, on my biology course, and um, a C is not a great uh, grade for getting into medical school. And so I had a conversation with... Um, the professor of the course, I wanted to speak to her in her office hours and try to see how 
we could, um, how I could improve and how, and really looking for support. Instead, um, the professor said, not everyone is meant to do medicine. And so that hit me like a ton of bricks. I was um, very discouraged and, um, but I remembered something my dad always said in Spanish. And the two words that he always used to motivate me was, uh, were echale ganas. Echale ganas in Spanish, uh, that in English translates to mean give it your all. So I did that. I turned it around and I worked harder. And so at the end of the second semester, I received a B as a grade. And I was very proud of my B because she did not think I was going to get a B in that course. Um, and so I, I give that as an example because I think um, a lot of um, students uh, potentially feel that one bad grade is uh, life altering, but it's not. I think it's, a, I think it's more important to remember where you're coming from, who, you're, who you are, what your story is, and really share that. Um, I think over the years, I've learned to do that more um, instead of um, just kind of, you know, just moving along the path. Um, so, so I did that. Um, so it gets me to my next point, which is standardized testing. I have always been a poor standardized test taker. I have always, um, uh, uh, ch this, this has been the biggest challenge of my, you know, of my life. Um, and so I want to emphasize to all, everyone here listening that this is, um, just, a portion of of uh, your application to schools. This is just a portion of who you are. It is not the most important portion. It's just a factor in 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 the mix. Um, and I took for after after graduating Columbia, I took the MCAT, and um, I didn't do well. Um, and um, I struggled with it, and I was um, kind of had a setback and really think about my next steps and. Um, given that my grade was not as high as I anticipated, I went ahead and uh, spoke to my guidance counselor at Columbia, my pre-medical uh, counselor, and uh, she suggested I take a gap year, something that I had never thought about. And for those who don't know what a gap year is, literally just taking a year out uh, after college to do something else. Um, uh, and at that point, I applied to a program where I was teaching um, uh, health in uh, uh, Washington Heights. And it was a great program and I learned a lot from, from that experience. But when I told my parents this, you know, they're coming from a very Hispanic background. They're like hard workers. They, they just know, go with the motions, keep going, keep going, keep going. My dad, um, who is very vivacious and who was very uh, uh, encouraging always, I really felt that this was the first time he felt disappointed in me. He, he thought, you know, I was going to give up on going ahead and going to um, uh, medical school. But I explained to him that I learned that when you want to apply to something like medical school, you want to give it your, your best shot the first time you apply. And that taking that year out will give me the opportunity to improve my income. And so I did. I, uh, I, took, I took the year out. I took the MCAT uh, again, and um, I received several interviews in med for medical school and was accepted to two medical schools. Um, I was fortunate to be accepted to the University of Rochester, and that's where I did my medical training. And um, I think that uh, the University of Rochester is this little ge gem in uh, Rochester, New York, that um, is uh, was a great experience and really um, made me into the doctor that I am. And I think that it really uh, was a great experience. And so um, after, um, after medical school, and not, and not to belabor the point about standardized testing, there is, um, there is another standardized test that is very important for licensing um, for doctors. Um, they're U USMLE, or commonly known as step one, step two, step three. And so I, um, I went ahead, um, and you, uh, before applying to residency programs, you, you have to take step one. And step one is a very challenging exam. And luckily right now it's already pass fail. So there's no number associated to step one, which is actually, in my opinion, a good thing. Um, at that point where I took it, 
um, it was um, not pastel. There was a numerical number associated to it. And um, the number that I received was one point above passing, one point above passing. And so, again, not the grade I want, not the grade, grade I wanted, I had strived to work for. But my point being that this part of my uh, application and this part of my journey was not a deal breaker. It didn't, it didn't uh, stop me from being a doctor. And so, uh, again, these are parts of the puzzle, but they're not the entire puzzle. And I just want to really emphasize that for some of the students that may be listening to this. So um, after um, getting into residency, I, uh, I went to a matching process, and I, um, I, which is uh, uh, something of, a, a, of an experience. But uh, long story short, I matched into um, the Yale Primary Care Program, which is focused on developing doctors in primary care. And um, it re reinforced my desire to be a primary care doctor. And um, I knew I wanted to get out in the community. I knew I wanted to be on the front lines and I knew I just wanted to, to do primary care because that's what I had always hoped for. And I did it for four years and I loved it. I loved being with my patients, developing longitudinal relationships with all my patients and families. I was taking care of families. It was just a great experience. Um, but I... Um, I also realized I was in this, my comfort zone. Um, and, uh, and I was also starting to notice it was becoming repetitive and that uh, I feel like I needed more. So, um, so I, uh, I decided it was time for a change. I wanted to do something different. I didn't know what. So um, with the encouragement of my wife, um, I called my, uh, one of my, uh, best uh, advisors. Uh, and so he was my pro uh, residency program director. And I called him and I said, I think it's time for a change. I'm looking at these options for jobs. Um, and he, he, he's a very uh, interesting guy who, uh, who I admire a lot. And he's kind of like a chess player. He knows all the pieces are moving and how to move them. And he may know when someone is ready to do something that they, they may not know that you know that they're ready for so i i wasn't anticipating this opportunity um but he basically said i i want you to connect with um this doctor who's looking for another uh, uh, uh partner in the practice a colleague in the practice and um and i want you to speak with him and um and so i i want to take a pause to to mention from my perspective the difference between a mentor and a sponsor, right? Because a mentor is someone that you coaches you throughout, um, in my opinion, someone that you see frequently and really gives you guidance uh, about um, what, what to do in day-to-day -day activities or week-to-week -week activities. A sponsor is someone that promotes your growth, that gets you to the next step, that may open a door for another opportunity that you had no idea about. And so, what I um, when I spoke to my advisor, he sent this one line uh, email to um, to this to this doctor uh, where I was applying for this job, and he basically said, you know, Jorge is great, interview him. That's all he said, and got my foot in the door. Um, and so then I interviewed, and I've been at this current job for the last five years. And so, um, but the role was different. It involved teaching, which is something I had never thought about doing. He, uh, it was a faculty job at Yale, and I, um, as part of my job, I would be teaching medical residents, uh, PA students, medical students, a uh, variety of things, clinical skills and in, in internal medicine initially. Um, and so I really enjoyed that uh, opportunity. And so I went, um, and I, I've been here for five, for five years now. Over the years, I've really developed an interest for obesity medicine, as we mentioned before, and I am now a clinician educator where I uh, develop curricula in obesity medicine um, for all of the medical trainings. Um, and so that opportunity really got me out of my comfort zone. And so part of what I wanted to mention is many times 
in order to grow, you might have to get out of your comfort zone. And many times when you think you've reached your goal, it may be time to push that goalpost a little further because something else is coming down the pipe. And so I really felt that having that sponsor really pushed me to the next level without me even knowing. So I'm going to shift gears here, but I wanted to stop and just see if anybody had any questions um, and uh, I uh, had any uh, comments and then I can move on about some other things I wanted to discuss. I just want to say your parents must be so proud. So proud. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, okay. So, so 2020, COVID hits. We all know the world was paralyzed uh, during COVID. And um, I was booked to be in the inpatient wards on April 20, 2020. Um, and I, this was before, planned before, years, a year in advance, we do our schedule and I was planned to be there. And so it really paralyzed everything. Um, but I, I think it was another point where my comfort zone was uh, affected. So these are some pictures of me in the front lines um, on the COVID units. This, I think most of these are from April of 2020. And luckily we did have PPE. We, luckily we had um, uh, a great team. And I think that um, all the work that gets done in this kind of uh, uh, environment is teamwork. And I cannot emphasize that this is not a me thing. This is a teamwork thing. And uh, I'm just uh, focusing on some of the uh, lessons learned from this experience. And so, so yeah, so the COVID front lines uh, were tough. I was inpatient, but I was also managing outpatient uh, patients uh, in my clinic. So I was doing both. Um, and I, I want to emphasize that it was a different world from my perspective before vaccines and after vaccines. Before vaccines, from my perspective, I had no idea how a patient with COVID was going to do. I did not know if they were going to, uh, to be in the hospital. I did not know if they were going to be able to stay home. I did not know what the outcome was going to be. The stress of having that um, call that another patient was COVID positive before vaccines was extremely, extremely stressful. Um, so after vaccines, I think that the stress level subsided in me. I think a lot of colleagues also had less stress because really vaccines changed the outcomes of all of all patients with, uh, with COVID. And, you know, I, I can talk about this for hours, but I, I don't want to belabor the point. What I will say is that what I noticed is the patients in the, in the emergency room and the patients in the hospital and in my clinic that got affected with COVID were Hispanic or Black in higher proportions than white. But there was also a lot of misinformation out there. And this is something that really put me out there that, I did, uh, that took me way out of my comfort zone. Because as I'm speaking to you here, you know, I, I've done a lot of forums in the past about this and I've done, a, but it, it was not my comfort zone. It is still not my comfort zone. I still uh, get, uh, my heart rate revs up right before every presentation. Um, and so, but what I realized is two points. I think that I realized so much misinformation out there, so much, uh, so much myths about COVID and about the disease and about the vaccines that I felt really an urge to say something about it because it was not getting done. And then the other part I noticed is that there was a gap in language, uh, pertinent, uh, culturally sensitive information to patients that were being mostly affected. And so I felt that we needed to do something in Spanish. So uh, this is January 1st of 2021. And I did a little Twitter video totally out of my comfort zone. This was like the first time I did anything like this before. And I just play a little snippet of it. Can you hear it? 
No sound. Okay. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna switch the share the share option. Whoops. I'm just going to stop share for one second and then reactivate the sound because I didn't click on that before. Con la vacuna. Ayer me pusieron la vacuna en el brazo izquierdo y tuve un poco de dolor esta mañana y, es, y, uh, y anoche, pero ya el dolor se fue y ya no tengo ningún otro efecto secundario. Otras personas han reportado dolor de cabeza, un poco de fiebre y dolores en las conjunturas. En la mayoría de los casos, los efectos secundarios... Estoy aquí para responder algunas preguntas frecuentes sobre la vacuna contra COVID-19. ¿Es segura la vacuna contra el COVID-19? Hasta la fecha, todos los datos reportados indican que la vacuna es segura y no tiene efectos secundarios graves a largo plazo. Todo efecto secundario inmediato. Hola, soy el doctor. So, like I, you know, like I said, I was taken out of my comfort zone and put in a, and, and, and this was more, you know, some people may, may say it's a calling, right? But I really felt that um, committed to really educating the community about this, and um, I think that it took a, it took a lot of time to first educate myself about all this information because I think that in order for me to be helpful, I needed to know know the data, the evidence, and really be able to um, to translate it into from complex medical language into simple uh, language that everybody could understand. And so I think that all the years of clinical experience as a primary care provider, where I do this every day, really helped me shape that message so that people could understand. And um, I, um, I did have some collaborations with the Connecticut Department of Health, with Yale uh, School of Medicine, with Yale Health Systems. And so we basically um, not only helped directly um, some of the patients uh, with these forums that that were created throughout the pandemic and throughout the vaccine rollout, but also we we helped uh, train some of the trusted messengers in the community because I'm not the only trusted messenger, right? So there are much better trusted messengers because they're people that the community trusts more directly, and so for example, there's uh, the Ad Council did a survey on, um, on trusted messengers, and the number one trusted messenger was your spouse or partner, right? You will trust your spouse or partner, number one. You will trust your immediate family mem uh, members, number two. Then doctors, then your close friends, and then scientists. And I think that there also was some evidence for religious leaders as someone that is a, a trusted messenger. And so, so as, a, as a result of that, um, there are certain characteristics that a trusted messenger have. And so a trusted messenger, someone who is uh, um, considered honest, consistent in their community involvement, um, provides an unbiased uh, uh, perspective um, and really is able to take in different uh, points of view so that they're able to help address that question that the, the patient or the community member may have about the vaccine or about anything, any topic, right? Because at the end of the day, the trusted messenger could be you, right? As long as you have the information um, or where to look up the information, that is a, a one step really towards combating a lot of the misinformation out there, really, because um, really empowering everyone to really try to be a messenger of, uh, of this type, because it's important. And as we, we move forward, it's going to be even um, more important uh, because right now the trust in the medical world is not as high as it used to be. The trust in the scientific world is not as high as it used to be. We really have to continue to educate ourselves so that when there is a question, we don't stay silent because then that misinformation continues. We, we can say something, right? We can say the first step no, look up, you know, I saw this on the CDC website or I saw this on my doctor's website or, or what have you. So that that provides that additional information for, uh, for uh, patients and community members. Um, you want to do, you want to uh, uh, 
a character another characteristic is someone that you trust someone who's independent i think that had i been working for any of the vaccine uh, manufacturers it would have been taken a little bit differently uh, or had i been in a different role would have been taken a little differently i think that there is something to be said about speaking the language of the of the patient and being culturally sensitive. So not everyone has to speak the language, but being culturally aware of the nuances of the various cultures is important. You know, we classify the Latinx or the uh, or the Hispanic population as one entity, but there are multiple type, uh, types of countries and, and cultures behind that. Uh, you know, uh, I'm from Mexico, my wife's Puerto Rican, we have very different ways of expressing ourselves. And I think that really being aware of those nuances can really uh, affect the engagement uh, between uh, whoever the trusted messenger is and uh, the the recipient of the information. So, so those were some of the things I I learned from this experience, right? And so, um, so this kind of uh, also some this slide summarizes some of what I just said, which is basically um, there are um, do you want to you want someone to to raise awareness so. I think part of my role was uh, I had multiple hats, but one of them was to amplify the message really and really get the correct information out there. And then, whoops, and then um, understand the information, have people that understand the information to provide more information. And then um, people that are right next to the target audience, right next to the recipient of the information that are the persuaders, the ones that get the deal done, right? Like talk about different things. And so I really think that uh, this framework is something that will continue because it's important for everyone to really, uh, I, I challenge everyone to step out of their comfort zone and do something like this uh, because it really will uh, help get the correct message out. And it's, it's a, uh, um, as Danielle say, uh, you, sometimes you go with the uh, with the flow, right? You just have to see uh, where the where the recipient of information is, and you you may not have this perfect plan, but the outcome may may be worth it, right? So I think that that's uh, that's important to to understand um, the the my type of art as, as is very different than. Than Danielle's, but I think in many ways we we had a lot of overlap in what she was saying in terms of how um, we don't often know the outcome, um, we don't often know how it's going to turn out. But I think that um, art heals, and in in this case, art can also inform, right? And so I think that that's something that I took away from her great um, keynote. So. Um, so yeah, like I was mentioning, oh, it's important to um, community organizations were huge during this time, and they they continue to be important vehicles uh, of uh, relaying information because they are in the community. They know the they know exactly who to target, and so I think that that was something that I really took away from this um, and how important they are. And I like I can't say it enough. It was a team based approach. It was it was not. I think there was hundreds and hundreds of people doing all this throughout the, the state, throughout the, the country. And I, and everyone was trying to do their part to, to, to get these communities uh, healthier and uh, to stay safe. So some future directions. Um, so in my uh, recent work um, with obesity, um, I think that there's a couple of points with obesity that I like to make. Number one is um, there's a lot of stigma and bias in obesity. Um, that needs to be clarified. And from my perspective as an obesity specialist, obesity is um, a disease that is misunderstood and um, it, it is um, often blamed on the individual. Um, whether it's, um, a, you know, oftentimes many uh, people say it's a willpower situation, that it's about how much effort they put in, how much um, uh, ability they have to exercise or eat well, etc. Lifestyle is a foundation to all treatments in obesity, but it is not the only answer. And there is biological reasons for this. Um, so um, the um, the other the other point I'd like to uh, reinforce is that we have to inform the most vulnerable populations. And again, we see that the prevalence of obesity is highest in African Americans and and Latinx communities. And so 
really trying to get the message targeted to them and really trying to get it in their language or in um, with uh, uh, honing in on their concerns. I think that that's something that is really important. And um, this is something that, again, um, points out the fact that I sometimes break out of my comfort zone, right? So I, I am active on Twitter and I'm active on um, Instagram and LinkedIn, um, but but uh, often I always hesitate whether to comment on something or not. And um, this uh, opportunity that came about recently um, is a comment I made on an Instagram post that um, there, were, there was a story on CNN about um, uh, obesity medications and the new newest wave of medications that are the injectable medications that many of you may have heard about, Ozempic, Bovi, Mujaro, et cetera, et cetera. And um, I just made a comment about how I, about how I think that obesity is a chronic disease and, um, and there's uh, more nuance to what was said in the story. And a couple hours later, I get a email from a CNN producer that they want to chat with me. And, um, uh, about obesity medications, and um, I was I was uh, featured in a special uh, in an episode of a podcast by uh, Dr. Sanjay Gupta, who uh, produces a podcast called called Chasing Life. And so um, I'm going to play you a snippet, and you're welcome to go and find it. It's on your podcast or um, or any YouTube uh, option you have. It's uh, the episode is is Ozempic really a miracle? And so I'll just play a snippet for you for everyone. And safe these medications are really going to be. That's why on today's show, I'm turning to an expert in obesity medicine and weight loss to try and get some answers. I remember, I remember exactly. I was in my office reading the article about semaglutide, Ozempic. And, you know, my first response was, it works. It really works. Dr. Jorge Moreno is an assistant professor of medicine at Yale School of Medicine. He treats patients looking to manage their weight. And when we sat down to chat, he answered a lot of the burning questions I had about these medicines. So today, we're going to go beyond the hype and talk about what anyone should really know about these medications, from the benefits to the risks to the unknowns. I'm Dr. Sanjay Gupta, CNN's chief medical correspondent, and this is Chasing Life. So um, with that, um, I wanted to open it up for any questions you had um, and really encourage you all to step out of the comfort zone and uh, really um, try to see how you, uh, you can promote messages of uh, kindness, messages of um, art as healing, art as information. So with that, I'll end the discussion today. You can either put your questions in the chat if you don't feel comfortable asking or just raise your hand. Before we go, Ms. Linda, do you have um, a closing statement for us, please? Thank you for being our artist today. Next Monday, February 19th, Mashan Jackson, Director of Community Outreach for Network Support Services in Corporate, will speak of the program he works at, his life experience, and how he aims to inspire social change and make a difference in so many lives. For more information on this and all of the series past and upcoming events, please go to the website https.adulty.eduartivism.org. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, at Artivism for Shared Community, or simply Google Artivism and Algophy. Our YouTube channel is Artivism for Shared Community. Also, if you would like to get more involved in this ongoing initiative, please contact the Artivism team. I would now like to ask if there are any questions for our Artivism. Please use the raise hand function or in Zoom, unmute yourself or ask your question in the Zoom chat. I have a question. 
Uh, thank you so much. This was wonderful. Uh, I can't even imagine what it must have been like being in, in the hospital during or being in uh, taking appointments while all this was going down. And as you mentioned, encountering the misinformation and how you how you have to be strategic about it. Um, and I really, really thought that that uh, the visual of who the folks are that can best facilitate the dissemination of of trusted information, trusted people uh, passing along information. I was wondering in certain com which communities did you find were more, um, you know, we've heard a lot about understandable. It's understandable that certain communities would mistrust. Uh, the medical and certainly the pharma pharmaceutical industries. But what other sources of misinformation did you encounter in speaking with patients? I think um, social media um, by far was the biggest uh, source of misinformation. I think there was a lot of uh, celebrities that talked about a lot of information that was incorrect and a lot of people followed that information incorrectly. Um, I think that um, there's, uh, it's interesting, um, a lot of the social media options out there that you or I may not use, other people are using a lot. So for example, um, in, in the Hispanic world, WhatsApp is extremely common and extremely used um, for various reasons, for things, even for purchasing things. So the very, uh, I, I don't use it in that way, but many, many uh, patients, um, communities uh, in um, the Latinx community use it that way. YouTube is another source of information, good and bad. Um, so I think um, I think really um, trying to fig figure out where the information is coming from is number one. And then um, really trying to see if it's a trusted source. And then with regard to um, the, the, various, uh, the various communities, I think, um, the, the questions were similar across the communities. I think that um, there was a, a, a little bit of a messaging glitch, I would say, that needed to be clarified on multiple fronts uh, and multiple times. And so um, I, I, I think I heard from various communities the same questions in different form. And so I think that that got me to thinking that it's really more of the concept than a particular uh, issue with uh, from a particular community, right? So I, I think that there was a, it, it was uh, global, in my opinion. I, um, they they focused on different things, but I think at the end of the day, it was very similar across communities. Interesting. Do you feel like the like medical? To... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to follow up to see if um, do you feel the medical community now has a a roadmap for the next time in order to perhaps maybe mitigate the, I mean, there's I mean, no way to. Yeah, there's no, there's, I, I think that um, first identifying the problem is number one. And I think that um, we've uh, over time, more and more agencies, federal agencies, state agencies have noticed how big of a problem this information is. And I think that um, now there's ways to tackle it more. Uh, I think that this is still, the the misinformation often travels faster than the correct information and um, and so I think um, being very um, skeptical of some of the information before you make a conclusion is important and, and going back to who you're trusting with this information right and so uh, not taking it at face value all the time and so that's something that uh, that I would uh, encourage uh, people to do. Go ahead, Ms. Castro. Hello, uh, good afternoon. Thank you for an excellent presentation and for sharing your um, incredible journey and your story with us. Um, it's very inspiring, um, as many have mentioned here in the chat. So I wanted to, to touch upon your experience as um, someone who's undocumented. Um, what, um, you know, what are some lessons or what, what are some 
takeaways in terms of how we can support undocumented students currently who are facing so many challenges. Um, we know DACA um, has not um, is is virtually on the cutting board, um, and a number of um, undocumented students don't even have that that support, um, you know, to to have um, deferred action. Um, and a number of undocumented students are graduating from high school, um, but the their their opportunities or the the access to higher education or post secondary education is very limited. Um, and obviously, as you mentioned, um, a lot of your success has to do with your hard work, your own initiative, your parents' support. Um, but we know that um, that's not enough, right? Institutions also have to step up and also have to integrate and implement policies to support um, the most vulnerable students, um, like uh, undocumented students. So I don't know what um, what takeaways or what um, what um, suggestions or recommendations you have for institutions of higher education, both at the undergraduate level and then at the professional graduate level, yeah. like in medical yeah. school, for for to support students. Yeah, no, I think that that's an excellent point. Um, I'm not an immigration expert, but I will tell you that from personal experience and from even within my family, immediate family, the differences in each individual as a number or an entity that, that has to go through the process is so different, right? Um, if you are, just as an example, if you are a minor, you're treated differently than if you're not a minor, right? Within your own family. And so the experiences I had and the experiences my older siblings had were different coming from the same family, right? And so that gets to the problem where, uh, or to the point that the, the immigration system is um, is complex and it's messy and it's not logical. Um, but uh, that's just, again, my perspective on, on that. And I do agree with your point about more support. And I think that um, more and more states in, in more so than the federal government at this point, but states, certain states that have a huge uh, population of undocumented immigrants have stepped up to the plate and figured out something that they can help them with, California being one. Um, but I think that more needs to be done and um, more needs to be done um, in, in general because a lot of, uh, just like my story, people want to work, people want to do different uh, th things in the country, fill in job gaps that are, uh, that are there, fill in uh, different professional shortages that we have in nursing, physician assistant, and medical degrees, and teachers, right? There is a lot of opportunity for allowing more um, uh, uh, Im immigrants to really help this country continue to thrive. And I think that we're, we were, this country was built on uh, immigration as being an open policy in the past. And I think that there has there's a lot of pros to that. And I think there has to be strict strategies implemented at uh, at a uh, you know government level to really help with figuring this all out. When in regard to the uh, to the higher education piece, I think that um, promoting um, these stories and other stories for uh, your students or the students in in a particular institution is important, so that they're aware of you know what what they're bringing into what what asset they are to the institution and what um, uh, skills they're bringing into the institution that uh, that uh, is unique and important for that institution. I think that highlighting that is really important so that they we we don't hide in the shadows. I think that we have to be more outspoken. And I've realized this as I as I've um, seen more of this. Um, so I myself uh, just really being able to share my story with you is uh, um, you know, it's it's uh, uh, was not easy to do the first time, but it it is something that I think is important to to be able to voice. And so, yeah. With all that said, um, for example, in the medical world, I'll just end with this. Um, there is a high there is a need for more resident slots for um, international medical students, right? And so, that is something that could really help with the shortages of primary care, shortages in all types of medical fields. And um, uh, I could go on uh, about this, but, but, but I think that people are realizing this. And I think that the policies of the government and the policies of the institution should help support this. And um, hopefully with time and with more uh, uh, stories from other uh, from other uh, students um, working 
alongside and following my story will be able to uh, open up the doors a little bit more. So I think it's uh, hopefully a matter of time. I would like to take a second here first to thank our speakers, uh, Dr. Moreno and Sherry. And I would like to ask everyone to please help me say a big thank you to Ms. Lalo, our marvelous artivism ambassador for today. Uh, of course, I also have a question. Thank you to all here. But then, um, Dr. Moreno, I, in apropos to the questions that you were just asked, I see the connection both from misinformation, not only through the medical field, but also in regards to the um, migrant situation that is currently happening. Um, as you discuss with the medical information, we can argue that is potentially the same with uh, the uh, uh, media outlets pushing forth certain stories more than others when it comes to immigration. Right. I'm just putting it out there, perhaps if you have any comments on that. And the second part is that I would like to know, what would you say to yourself when you were that little kid in that car at the Frontera, right? Right. What right. would you say currently now in 2024 <laughs> to that little boy coming across? Yeah. Um. So... Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with you, Carolina. I think that it's important to um, to understand the stories of the, the people that are coming to this country and figuring out a way and a strategy to, to help support them um, in, a, in a humane way. Um, the, um, the, the misinformation that is out there about this is, is true, is a lot. And I, I don't think anyone would be leaving their country if things were OK. Right. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's not only that, like uh, leaving their country without the language, without resources like th this, there, there is uh, some uh, there is a lot of things going on in the world. And I think that um, it speaks to the United States as the strength of um, our our morals and our um, values. And I think that more and more. Hopefully, with time, we're we're going to be able to heal some of the division that's around in the country. Um, I don't think we're perfect, but I think that we we can strive to to work towards that. Um, and then, with regard to what I would say to myself, you know, I think even as a as a young boy, I had a lot of dreams um, and I had a lot of uh, um, uh, goals in life. Um, and I I think. Um, I, I would just uh, say, you know, to, to piggyback on what my dad would tell me, I would just say, echale ganas, right? I would just say, give it your all. Just really, you you will do, um, uh, you, you, you will be helpful to your community. You will be helpful to your family. And I, I think that um, that's what I would say. I think, I, you know, uh, uh, as, you, as you remember, Carolina, my, my, my father uh, passed away in 2020 um, uh, during the COVID pandemic, um, he was diagnosed with metastatic cancer. And so I was also dealing with that uh, on the personal level during that pandemic. So it was, uh, it was a very challenging times on multiple fronts, right? And so I think that um, he, a lot of what I'm doing now, I feel is uh, him pushing me to do more than I ever thought I could be, uh, you know, possible. So that's what I was, what I, that's what I would say. Uh, Vicky put in the chat that she's also interested in obesity as a disease and learning more. Are there links on your site that, that we can go to, to learn more? Yeah. So I really encourage you to listen to the, uh, the podcast I did two weeks ago. Um, it's very open. It's very, uh, uh, from what I from what I gather from some of the feedback is very easy to understand. Um, I try to really make it um, in an easy to understand way. Um, and but it does get some technicalities in there. But I think that the that's one way to to look at, look at it. Um, the Obesity Action Coalition is an organization that does a lot of um, uh, work on treating obesity as a disease and uh, patient centered language, uh, which is very important in, in the obesity world to really understand. So. That's, a, that's another resource for uh, um, for you. Uh, 
Um, I have one quick question. Dr. Moreno, thanks for sharing your story. Also um, very inspiring. I'm wondering if there are any ways that you can think of where we can merge and help amplify the work that you're doing around obesity with art, um, whether that's through visual arts or film or any yeah. projects that you can. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I think that um, there is there is some work because um, there's a lot of stigma with the pictures that are used often in obesity um, because we always, um, if you think about it, you look at a picture of someone that has obesity sitting on the couch eating potato chips, which is not the case. Um, and so promoting uh, obesity as a, a normal uh, part of life where someone is a professional going to work or someone is um, a teacher or someone is playing with their family instead of focusing on the negative and the stigma, right? Like we focus on uh, uh, media puts these pictures all the time and people on scales and how triggering that can be for someone. And so it would be awesome for visuals that, and, and there are some already, but I think it would be even, there's more to be done, right? So there, it would be awesome to have visuals that show people, a patient with obesity in, in their regular normal world, instead of putting them into these marginalized settings that are not often true. Right. And so I would, I would uh, definitely think that that's some place where art could be extremely helpful and even art with words, right? Like we were just talking about it um, uh, because uh, there's a lot of uh, words that are very triggering, uh, you know, fat, obese, those types of words are very triggering. And so trying to step away from that and uh, creating uh, creating more patient-centered language that could be helpful for de uh, decreasing the stigma and bias of patients with obesity. Thank you. I think the one thing I have to say maybe in closing all of this and then giving it over to Carolina for the takeaway is that no matter what your um, you know field of study, what your discipline is, is that we need to know the communities we work with, the communities we serve, right? Um, knowing them, understanding them, and respecting them, whether it's, you know, a community uh, um, with the individuals that are obese, um, you know, the the communities you were working in during the COVID um, epidemic, you need to know their their, their culture, right, in, their, in order to serve them better. So really understanding that is important. Um, Carolina, do you want to do the takeaway if there are no other questions? Yes, I see a comment on the chat. It mm -hmm. says uh, from uh, Edinil Naraki, it is important yeah. also to push against body shaming in schools. And now as a tradition here in Artivism to our closing, we ask our presenters, in this case, Dr. Moreno, keynote speaker, uh, Ms. Sherry, and our Artivism ambassador for a key takeaway from everything that was mentioned today, from your perspective, each one of you. Therefore, we will start with you, Ms. Cherry. Um, a key takeaway for me after listening to um, the speakers is to not be afraid to speak up. I think that's what's needed most. Everyone has perspectives, different experiences, and something to share. And it doesn't all have to look the same. And sometimes we might touch someone based on our very personal perspective. And so it's important for us to share and speak. Uh, Ms. Lalo? I agree. I think my main takeaway was probably to follow your heart and do what you do best and listen to what you think your purpose is. In so, yeah. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Moreno? I think in the spirit of activism, right, art is healing and it can be informative. And I think that um, working together to, uh, as a team to get to that point is really going to be something that could be very helpful for our communities uh, and uh, for promoting this art activism work.
Okay, thank you everyone for being here today. Artivism, the power of art for social transformation, the independent entity. would like to thank our sponsors, Adelphi University, Sync for Hope, Goddesman Libraries of Teachers College at Columbia University, um, Dr. Stephanie Lake and Carolina, um, Dr. Moreno, uh, um, Danielle and Zoe. Thank you all for being here um, and kicking off season seven. Uh, thank you so much. We hope thank to you. see you again soon. Thank bye you, bye. everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye, -bye. bye.